Welcome to APA's 25th Town Hall on COVID-19. My name is Billy Zydek, Standards and Codes Administrator for APA. Allow me to review a couple of housekeeping items before we start. All attendees are in listen-only mode. We ask that you utilize the chat box for the Q&A segment in this session. While we attempt to respond to all questions submitted, should we run out of time, responses will be posted to our APIS COVID-19 RAQ, Recently Asked Questions webpage. We also remind participants to ensure their speaker volume level is set to your comfort. Our speakers are gathering us from across the continent, and as such, varying volumes will be present. Today's session will award professional continuing education credit, as well as APIS credentialing points and AIACLUs. For AIA certificates, please email Billy at Billy, B I L L I E, at APA.org, along with your AIA membership number if you have not done so in the past. Our webinar recording will be posted to APA's website later this afternoon. Additionally, you will receive a follow up email within 72 hours providing designated links to all webinar recordings presentation slides, as well as information on upcoming webinars and town halls. At this time, it's my pleasure to introduce Lander Medlin, APA's Executive Vice President, your moderator for day, today. Lander, take it away. Thank you, Billy, and thank you, Suzanne, for all the work you do uh, to pull together this town hall. And welcome all attendees. We appreciate your engagement in these town hall meetings as we further explored the impact of COVID-19 on our facilities organizations and the education enterprise. Now, given our upcoming professional development delivery of the virtual AFS, we're calling it APAS Facility Symposium, this coming November 16 to 18, 2020, our next town hall will occur Friday, December 4, 2020, with a different target and focus on experience exchange around your remaining challenges. Now, as always, thank you for joining the dialogue. Please post your questions at any time. That's what makes this a rich conversation and the special community we share. Now, as schools move toward the close of the fall semester, planning for the spring semester and our institutional futures is more critical than ever, and so much is at stake. Navigating through this crisis will require intentional disruption and transformative thinking to create a framework to meet these challenges. Now that's why we chose this topic today, planning for new realities, shifting your mindset. It is also why we chose this amazing panel from outside the institutional purview to bring us the wealth of experience and expertise concerning the academy. As such, they will provide an enterprise-wide perspective on addressing financial realities, using data to drive organizational performance and developing cultures to work collaboratively. Now, as such, here's the format for today's town hall. I'll provide an introduction to set the past two weeks' context, introduce each panel member who will provide their thoughts and perspectives, then address your questions and conclude by highlighting traditional or, or additional resources and final closing remarks. Two weeks ago, I said the pandemic had gotten ugly. Little did I know we would enter new terrain and enter quickly. The U.S. surpassed 9.5 million cases with infections rising in 42 states as the nation struggles to contain a third surge. Furthermore, cases exploded past the 100,000 mark in a single day for the second time this week, and it crested 120,000 cases since the pandemic began and more than any other country in the world and showing no signs of receding. Now, put in perspective, that's more than one new case every second. And over 20 states have recorded more cases in the last week than in any other seven day stretch. The Midwest and Great Plains have been particularly hard hit. And the country as a whole is continuing to climb sharply. In fact, we've had our worst two week period recording well over 1 million new cases as the coronavirus raged across the country. Deaths have increased 14% across the country in the last two weeks. More than 50,000 people are currently hospitalized and those numbers are trending upward, a 64% increase since the 1st of October. Ooh, hospitals are feeling the strain. 
Projections suggest another 100,000 Americans may die in just the next two months. All right, now some good news. Survival rates among severe virus patients are improving. This is good news. However, we are positioned poorly as winter rapidly approaches and could well compromise the healthcare system. Now let us understand that quarantine fatigue is real and people are ready to get back to normal. But with these rising cases and hospitalizations across the country, this is not the time to let our guard down. We need to do what we can to bend the curve back down to give our hospitals some relief. We must remain vigilant. We must take pandemic management seriously. Doctors have stressed basic public health measures by heeding the three W's, wear a mask, wash your hands, watch your distance, and avoid crowded settings or gatherings, especially indoors. It's gonna to be tough. Wearing a face mask is more important than ever. Please, it's just a simple swath of fabric, but oh so effective, a powerful tool at fighting the pandemic that can help save tens of thousands of lives in the coming months if 95% of Americans wore masks. Frankly, it's no different than putting on your seatbelt, a minor inconvenience that can save lives. Now, this will require a collective effort. Thankfully, our institutions have worked really hard to box in the virus through strategic testing, rapid contact tracing, supportive of quarantine, and effective isolation. Realize this pandemic is far from over, and together we have it in our power to shape what happens next. The latest news out of CDC now, a new study finds that pregnant women with COVID-19 are more likely to need intensive care. Thus, pregnancy has been added to the list of conditions that put people with COVID-19 at risk at increased risk of developing severe illness, including a heightened 70% increase risk of death. The economic devastation is undeniable, yet new filings for jobless benefits were little changed last week at 751,000, and that dropped just this morning to 698,000, showing layoffs stabilized at an elevated level as virus cases surged in several states. Now, still over 3 million people remain unemployed, and U.S. households, even though they increased spending 1.4% in September, there are mixed reviews on the economy at the third quarter mark. Although the U.S. economy grew 7.4%, GDP still lags pre-pandemic levels. In essence, the economy has climbed out only part of the way of its pandemic-induced hole, and progress is slowing, especially given the resurgence of coronavirus infections and potential new restrictions. Correspondingly, stocks suffered their biggest weekly drop since March. Now, it's a daily roller coaster ride. The Federal Reserve again said the coronavirus pandemic poses considerable risks to the U.S. economy despite recent gains. They're maintaining low rate pledges and recognizing the federal government has made no move on sustained stimulus. Again, the coronavirus hit economy needs more stimulus, and so could the education market sector. COVID's imprint on higher education is dramatically impacting the financial landscape of our institutions, further accelerating the issues that existed pre-pandemic, like declining enrollments, diminishing resources, widening skills gap, groundbreaking technological shifts, and deteriorating facilities. Now, I mentioned the unfortunate undergraduate enrollment drops during the last town hall. Now, the College Board reported published tuition and fees increases for 2020 2021 that were smaller, actually between one and 2%, the lowest since the early 1990s at both public and private nonprofit institutions. Institutions are recognizing the struggles students and families face in paying for college, especially during a pandemic. Further, the average tuition and free fees for in-district student at community colleges didn't increase in 14 states in 2021. And in 10 states, there was no increase in tuition and fees for in-state public four-year institutions. This is significant. Now, one estimate reported the pandemic has cost colleges and universities at least $120 billion. Stopgap measures won't cut it. The coronavirus has amplified the financial crisis institutions we're already grappling with pre-pandemic. We haven't seen a budget crisis like this in a generation. These kinds of disruptive challenges cannot be solved with an incremental technical shift in resource allocation that require a transformative adaptive solution 
and collaborative mindset across the enterprise tackled by those willing to do the work. Given the incredible stress on institutional budgets now and for the foreseeable future, will we choose a new path, a new framework, new ways of thinking, and embrace this crisis head on and for the long term? Our stellar panel today will provide their own assessment of the situation and why the traditional paths taken during crises in the past won't successfully drive the changes we need for the future we face. So let's get going with our first panel member. Larry Goldstein, President, Campus Strategies, LLC, and facilitator, APA Thought Leader Series. Larry provides management consulting services to colleges and universities throughout North America. His latest book, College and University Budgeting, A Guide for Academics and Other Stakeholders, its fifth edition, was published in 2019. Previously, he served as Senior Vice President and Treasurer for the Kubo, the National Association of College and University Business Officers, and he had a 20-year career in higher education, financial administration. He is a CPA and earned a Bachelor of Accountancy degree from Walsh College and a Master of Science degree from the University of Virginia. Larry's background in finance, combined with his consultative and facilitator expertise with senior institutional leadership teams, provide just the right vantage point to open this conversation and explore our financial realities, impacts, and responses. He will help us consider how to advocate for your area. Larry? Thank you, Lander. Um, it's great to be with you folks. Uh, Billy, if I could get that first slide and uh, to have an opportunity to discuss this and really to offer a new approach. Lander, uh, during her opening remarks, commented that our past responses are not going to help us in this situation. This is, this is too different from anything we've experienced before. In fact, on the next slide, I kind of talk about a little bit of the history that we can refer to. And if we think about similar past situations, the two most obvious would be the Great Recession, 2009, 2010, and for many, lasting much beyond that. Um, that was a, obviously a serious situation. Many institutions were put in significant financial distress. Um, some of the things that I'll be talking about when I get to the uh, slide a little uh, time from now about traditional responses were uh, used during the Great Recession and, and for the most part used successfully. But um, that was even limited in its scope. Most people working in higher education at that time understood the significance of the problem. But for the vast majority of people and the vast majority of institutions, there was no belief that their institution wouldn't survive. And, and, and the vast majority did. We did lose some institutions. We lost more institutions since the Great Recession than collectively we had lost in, in uh, cumulative decades. Uh, but even then, we were adding institutions. So it had a significant impact, but it wasn't such that people really questioned the viability of their institution or the longevity of their institution. So the next one that came to mind is I thought about, well, what, what do we know about these types of things? What can we learn from the past? Had to do with Katrina. And Katrina was devastating. Um, you know, it, 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 it was dramatic and it literally forced institutions out of business temporarily. So the institutions in the New Orleans vicinity shut down, uh, at least for a semester. However, when they did that, again, they did not anticipate that it would be long term. So a semester, not insignificant, clearly had revenue implications, clearly had uh, concerns for how to pay bills, that sort of thing. But again, it was localized. So if we broaden it and go back deeper in history, we can go back to the Great Depression. Um, that was devastating for every aspect of our economy and higher ed was not protected. They experienced significant downturns, institutions failed. Um, but again, that was a serious situation. People wondered what the end point might look like, when it would arrive, those types of things. And we can even refer back to the 1918 flu pandemic, which obviously is very similar to what we're seeing today with the COVID situation. What's not helpful about these historical references, though, is that there's nobody in a leadership position today who lived through them in a leadership position. So we don't have the benefit, other than through history books, of what worked and what didn't work at that time. So in essence, for the current leadership teams and pretty much everybody who's on this call, um, these are unprecedented times. Nobody has lived through anything remotely like this with the idea that an institution goes from operating business as usual one day and 
no idea what the future will hold. So let's talk a little bit about what some of the impacts are that we're experiencing. And Lander alluded to some of those. I'm going to focus most of my remarks on finance because that's the area that I spend the most time in. You all know that we have seen a dramatic downturn in revenues for institutions, and they've come in a variety of areas. So the most obvious one is enrollment for many institutions. Um, even for those where enrollment has remained fairly steady, for, the, for a number of those institutions, it's been virtual enrollment, which means from a revenue standpoint, they're not generating the revenues from housing. They're not generating the revenues from dining. They're not generating revenues from parking. There are any number of revenues that are student related that, that are being lost. Um, the same situation exists with respect to athletics, even in those situations where uh, among intercollegiate athletics conferences are competing in football, for instance, uh, there are many revenue flows that are not being realized. So obviously some of the pandemic was felt before ticket sales had even begun. The reality is that the revenues that you would generally see have not been forthcoming. So some institutions have talked about $100 million losses just from athletics in the current year. We don't know what that's going to look like going forward. Flipping the side uh, to expenses, the challenge with respect to expenses is we're getting rid of a lot of activities as we know them today, but we're not getting rid of a lot of the costs related to those activities. So many of institutional expenses carry forward from period to period, whether you have high enrollment, low enrollment, or even really, really low enrollment. So the challenge is you're still incurring expenses, and in fact, to the extent that you're offering in-person classes and you have students on campus, you're incurring lots of additional expenses expenses for PPE, expenses for addition, uh, uh, extra cleaning, expenses for just managing the reality of a campus, whether it's in full operation or limited operation. So we've got the dual challenge of reduced revenues and increased expenses, and the sad and scary part is we don't know what the future holds. We don't know whether we'll be able to return to normal work. All of this is tied up with respect to the vaccine and how we treat the virus and how society comes back with respect to the economy. All of these things are factors that are going to influence what we're able to do as institutions, how we're able to serve our stakeholders, and how we're able to get back to a reasonable business model. And one of the things I think should be a message taken away from this session is we don't expect to return to the same business model. So for instance, if you think about it, if someone had proposed at any institution who's a member of APA, if someone had proposed that we're going to go completely virtual with our instructional focus, they would have been laughed off campus. And they would have said, well, sure, maybe in two to three to four years we might consider doing something like that, but there's no way we're going to do a full conversion right now. And yet it was done in two weeks. We don't know how much of that's going to stick. So if we get the virus under control via a vaccine, and if we start to return to normal, we don't know what that normal is going to look like. Will students who historically had wanted to be on campus, or at least to take live classes, will they, will they be content to return to doing that, or will they opt to stay away from campus and do more and more virtually? Clearly, we're going to see improvements in that area, and that's going to bring additional costs. So, so let's talk about where institutions have gotten into even more trouble than they were at the start of the pandemic and how they chose to respond. And so um, our next slide discusses the issue of responses and the traditional ones. And I alluded to this earlier with respect to the Great Recession, and we saw this already with respect to the pandemic. So across the board, expense budget cuts. We've got a problem. Everybody's going to take a hit in their budget of 2, 5, 8, 10, 20 percent, whatever it's going to take seemingly to close the gap. And keep in mind, we were midway through the end of the fiscal year when, not midway, we were near the end of the fiscal year when the stay-at-home orders were implemented, when we moved to virtual. And so lots of expenses had already been incurred and couldn't be cut. But there were across-the-board budget cuts. We had spending freezes imposed immediately. Um, there were very few exceptions, by the way, with respect to those spending freezes you really had to be in a unique situation to get permission to spend money, even on things that might have been deemed pretty essential previously. Furloughs, again, I, I have been in higher education for over 40 years. I had not heard the word furlough applied in higher education until the Great Recession. It became a common tactic during the recession. 
and it's common today. It's happening all across higher education, even at institutions that we would have thought of as being particularly wealthy and elite institutions are employing furloughs and layoffs. So, you know, if you're not familiar with it, the concept of a furlough is a temporary um, uh, removal from work. It, it can be on a uh, periodic basis or it can be a temporary uh, short term basis versus a layoff where positions are being eliminated. Salary reductions for continuing employees have become even more common, especially for leadership teams across higher education. I wouldn't say it's universal, but again, large numbers of institutions are either imposing or voluntarily accepting salary reductions for the most senior people. And at some institutions, it's not just the most senior people. It's people, for instance, who are making over $50,000 annually. So $50,000 a year person is not considered wealthy by any means, but they are being asked to take a significant pay reduction for the remainder of a fiscal period. So, um, so, so that's, a, a, again, a traditional response. And then finally, and to me, most worrisome are ad hoc program elimination. And what I mean by that is senior leadership, in their wisdom, hopefully, decides which things the institution should stop doing, but not necessarily based on any data, based simply on their view of what they think works or what could contribute savings or what's essential that we can't get rid of because it's revenue generating. Oh, this isn't revenue generating. We, we can shed that program without any implications. So those are the traditional responses. And as Lander alluded in her opening, we don't think the traditional responses are going to be adequate to deal with the situation. So let's talk about some of the responses that I think are needed for transformation for the transformation that's required. Um, most importantly, and, and I, I just can't stress this too much, this problem is not going to be solved by any individual. Nobody in any position of authority has all the answers, period. There just are too many conundrums, too many things that are unknowable at this stage. Therefore, you need an inclusive approach with broad participation, and I mean broad participation across and up and down the organization. This is not something that is going to be solved purely by leadership. Many of the solution sets are going to come from people who I call the line workers, whether it's a faculty member or a staff member. They know so many things that the leadership can't know because of the difference in their roles. They see things. They have ideas. They're aware of things that, that maybe don't contribute to your success. So what I'm suggesting is we need a, a much more top-down, bottom-up action than we've ever seen before. So it's top-down because clearly senior leadership has the responsibility president is hired by the board of the system, he or she has a responsibility to build a leadership team, and it's their responsibility to guide and direct the institution. But so much of what happens, happens at a lower level in the institution. And that's where ideas need to surface, because they see things differently than senior leadership. And so we want to see ideas bubbling up from beneath, so that we get an airing of those things. And then if a decision isn't makeable, at a certain level, get it to the top as quickly as possible for action. Um, if, if it's ever been important to rely on data, it's, it's exponentially more important today, and both quantitative and qualitative data. One of the things that I spend a great deal of time doing is helping institutions go through what I call strategic resource allocation. And that's a, a academic prioritization is what you would, many of you would know it as. It's this idea that we're going to look at everything that the institution is doing and figure out which things are contributing to our success and which things do not. And that requires both a quantitative and a qualitative look. So even as the finance guy in this panel, I'm going to tell you money should rarely drive decision making in higher education. Now, I think money usually is a consideration that needs to be examined. But we don't do too many things solely because of monetary reasons, and I think that's a good thing. It's, it's consistent with our mission. So we're not in business to make money. By the way, we're not in business to lose money either. But we're not in business to make money. That shouldn't be the driver for our decision making. So it should, it should weigh in the decisions, but it shouldn't drive those decisions. So we need to consider qualitative things as well in terms of whether it's quality, whether it's demand, whether it's productivity, all those factors need to come in along with how important is this to the institution. So we could think of certain things that individual institutions value highly and therefore they need to be continued even if they consume resources because it's important to the culture of the institution, it's important to the mission of the institution. Now, one of the things that's really cr 
critical at this time is a need for creativity to pursue new avenues, new avenues of cost control and new avenues of revenue enhancement. And I, I want to stress one thing that I find to be problematic with some of the conversations I'm having with, having with campuses. Um, there is a tendency to be very hopeful, and I don't, I don't think that's an inappropriate thing to do, but if you bank your financial future on hopes and ignore the things you can control, the odds are not in your favor that that's going to end well. So the reality is you all would like more revenue. You'd like more revenue in absolute terms. You'd like more revenue streams. You'd like more new ways to generate revenues, and those are all good. But in few instances, do you have control over those? What you really have control over are your costs and your expenses. So you need to pay particular attention to the costs, the investments you're making currently, the expenses you're incurring, to determine whether they're really adding any value to your operation. And if they're not, that's something you can exercise control over. Hoping for new revenues isn't going to produce new revenues. I think what needs to happen on campuses is, as it's stated here, a candid willingness to identify what no longer works or is no longer needed. And that's, that's difficult. Keep in mind, everything that happens on a campus results in a consumption of resources. I think there are only five resources that really matter to a, to a campus and really to almost any operation. People, money, space, technology, and equipment. And because higher ed is so labor intensive, anything we do that's meaningfully going to reduce expenses means we're affecting people. And that's what makes us so difficult. And that's also what leads to some people not having the ability to take action, to implement decisions. You know, there's definitely a need to get as much data as you can before you make decisions, but you don't have an endless amount of time to pursue data. At some point you have to say, this is the best I've got, we're gonna make a decision, and we're gonna watch it closely and if it turns out not to be the right decision, we're going to make a different one very quickly. But action is required. If you just sit and watch this materialize, you probably won't be watching for very long. Okay, so what have we learned that uh, pretty much is an indicator of likely failure in responding to this? We can see the next slide, Billy. Um, sacred cows, nothing should be off the table for consideration. Again, unless it truly is essential to your character, just because you've always done it does not mean you should consider doing it in the future, continue doing it in the future. Um, we talk, I talked briefly about data and how important it is. Uh, corrupt or grossly inaccurate data will doom you. Uh, you have to have good data. No one has perfect data, but you need good data. This worries me a great deal because I see so many institutions who just tap the same people over and over again to try to respond to these types of issues. Don't rely on the usual suspects, get new people in the room. If it's viewed that what you're doing disproportionately affects or inappropriately affects certain sectors of the college, the university, you have to react to that. It's gotta be done as fairly as possible. If leadership won't take action, you're not gonna survive. You've got to move forward if you're going to, to make it into the next round. So what are the factors that lead to success? This will be my closing slide. Uh, don't forget the fact that you've already been planning. Much of what's in your existing plans that remains relevant. They may need some modification, but definitely refer back to your plans. Be transparent about what you're doing. Draw people into solving the problem. If you're open with them about your financial realities, they're going to be much more likely to help you deal with it. Extensive participation is required, and I think it's faculty, staff, and leadership. I think all sectors have something to contribute. Heck, at some institutions, you may even want to draw students in. It depends on your culture. As I indicated before, you're going to be in trouble if you don't treat things fairly. So you have to be sensitive to the impacts on people and ensure that what you're doing is fair for everyone or as, mon as many as possible. Um, you're not going to have perfect data, but you want to ensure you have good data, the best data you can get your hands on. And finally, be realistic about how quickly you're going to achieve results. Some of the ideas that you have to implement now won't be realizable until next year. But if you don't begin working with them now, you won't be ready for next year. So with that, I'm going to wrap this up until we come back for Q&A a little later and turn this back to Lander. That's really excellent, uh, Larry. What a wonderful macro look at what um, is occurring here. There were a few things that um, I would highlight. This 
I mentioned before there's no muscle memory for this and you did comment on that. We just don't have an experience in this. And so it does require us to think differently um, and that we shouldn't re expect to return to the same business model. And that is going to be critical. What will stick won't. won't. Um, I did like that you commented on this. We said, no way we can we do an online, completely online, right? Well, necessity is the mother of invention. And you were right. Boy, did we pivot rapidly. We're going to need that kind of sense of urgency and pivoting that we do to ourselves, right? Um, and that we will not um, solve it by one individual. So all of us are going to need to do that. Um, bottom up, critical, data critical. Um, and then, you know, finally, stressing that we do, I'm a very hopeful and optimistic person, but it is so important to highlight that we don't ignore the things that, uh, that we actually can control um, and, and do something about it. So that was really wonderful. And we will come back, we have um, a lot of questions will come up in terms of how we actually pull this off. And we have some, um, two panelists that are going to help us look at that. And I'm going to move now to Dwayne. Dwayne Hickling, Managing Principal, Hickling & Associates, LLC. Dwayne has more than 20 years of experience in aligning and executing organizational goals and objectives for higher education institutions with a passion for advancing the field of facilities management through data and technology, along with many other critically relevant areas of expertise. Formerly, Duane held positions of Associate Vice President at the University of Chicago and Assistant Vice Chancellor at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Interestingly, at the University of Southern California, he was the Executive Olympics Administrator for the 1984 Olympic Games moving, before moving into a facilities operations role as Executive Director of Facilities Operations and Maintenance Services. Duane will talk about the evolution of performance management and the importance of metrics to determine what actions and decisions will actually change those metrics and facilitate a higher level of discussion. He will provide a compelling story to illustrate this thinking and approach. Duane? Thank you, Lander. Uh, <clears throat> several years ago, I uh, had a discussion with the uh, senior facilities officers meeting at the APA. And uh, we started describing the evolution of uh, facilities uh, measurement, uh, measurement performance of uh, uh, facilities. And back in the 1980s, uh, Billy, if we could go to the first slide. Thank you. Back in the 1980s, I called it the first generation. Uh, we tended to uh, ask the question, what are we spending uh, uh, on our facilities portfolio? Are we spending enough and are we spending uh, as much as our peers? The measures uh, we tend to consider, the metrics, was comparison against peer group averages and benchmarks. Uh, benchmarking was very much in vogue in the, in the late 1980s, and that was frequently used as a measure of, well, then we're about right in our spending if we're spending what our peers are spending. But in the 1990s, uh, many institutions started asking a different question. The question was, are we getting full value from the resources that we're committing to sustaining our facilities portfolio? In other words, of all the resources, the money, the, the staffing uh, that we're committing to maintaining the campus, uh, are we getting full value from this? Uh, the measures being considered here were somewhat different. We, we started then looking at comparisons against identified best practices. Uh, was, were our maintenance practices and operations practices uh, uh, comparable to the best practices uh, that were being used for maintenance? We also started doing a lot more work with lean management process analysis, uh, making sure that the activities that were supporting uh, the maintenance process were adding value. Uh, it versus just passing information or creating activity that was not actually accomplishing our goal. Uh, but at the, as we got into the 21st century, uh, many institutions realized that there probably was a different question altogether. And that is, is our institutional facilities portfolio appropriate to, for the delivery of our mission? 
In other words, do we have the right amount of space? Space is expensive. It's expensive to build, it's a continuing expense to maintain, and it's an expense to renew. Do we have the right amount? Do we have too much? Do we not have enough? And is it appropriately appointed to support the whatever our mission is, the instructional research and, and student life mission of our institution? At this point, the measures that we considered are totally different. It's an intent, we need to look at the intensity of the usage of our space and analyze, is it the right space to be able to uh, support the instruction or research? Uh, <clears throat> this, the difficulty with this is, and this is what Larry Goldstein uh, referred to in terms of uh, inclusivity. This is not strictly a facilities management discussion. This is a conversation, to get at this answer, it's a conversation at the leadership level of academics, finance, administration, and facilities. One of the things I frequently hear from facilities managers when I travel around to different organizations and work with different institutions is that facilities managers are often uh, uh, complaining that they don't have a seat at the decision-making table. The academics or the finance leadership of the institution will make a decision about a particular initiative or direction, and the facilities management will then need to fall in line and try to support the decision. And <clears throat> the, the challenge with this is that we need data. We need to be able to provide information to be at that decision-making table. The people at that decision-making table are very busy, and they have there's a long list of resources that uh, they're trying to allocate to different things, uh, different activities in the institution. And if we come to, as facilities people, if we come to that table with hat in hand trying to get a uh, line in for those resources, we're probably not going to be welcome participants. We need to be able to come with data that that will help and support the decision-making uh, activities there. Uh, <clears throat> so looking at these three generations, generation one is not wrong. It's only incomplete. Generation two may be help complete the picture. It also is not wrong, but it can also support the third generation. So we need to make sure that we know how to link these together and make a, a, a complete story about how our facilities portfolio is performing and how it can support our institution. I wanna take us through uh, some actual data in terms of a case study uh, to maybe describe some of this. And the case study that we're trying to do, we're gonna look at a, 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 an institution, we'll call it institution one, and we're gonna look at uh, their, some of their data and, and how it compares and, and how it's evolved over a few years. And using this approach, we're going to try to understand the state of their funding and the state of their facilities management performance. So going to the next slide, I have a table of actual data that came out of the facilities, uh, APA's facilities performance indicators study. This, this is known as the APA FPI, and the Facilities Performance Indicators Survey, it's an annual survey that, is, uh, that any APA member can participate in every year for free if you're an APA member. <clears throat> and it will provide somewhere about four dozen different uh, performance metrics. Uh, to measure the facility's uh, portfolio performance. Everything from cost per space, on a gross square foot per space, uh, staffing density, uh, cost per student, BTUs, uh, utilities consumption, energy consumption, uh, et cetera. By using this data and identifying against it against the qualitative service levels being performed, it's very easy for an institution to start to create a picture of their performance. And so let me describe a little bit about what this table is showing. 
the first thing that we're showing over here in the in the left hand column are the diff are some selected metrics facilities operating expense this is measured as annual facilities operating expense sometimes shown as afoe the annual facilities operating expense it's the sum total of the annual ex annualized expenses, not counting capital and not counting purchased utilities uh, to maintain the campus. Purchased utilities are, are the paid utilities, and we can also add that into the AFOE. But it's the administrative expense for running the department. It's the uh, daily expenses of cleaning, custodial, it's the maintenance expense of the skilled trades, uh, taking care of the buildings, doing the preventive maintenance, doing the breakage repair. And it's the uh, uh, maintenance of the utility systems and running of the power plant. And if we add in uh, paid utilities or purchase utilities, that can be the electric bill, gas bill, water, sewer, uh, uh, what have you. Okay, so on this institution, this, this data was started about seven or eight years ago. This institution was spending just under $5 per gross square foot for on all of their space to maintain their space. They felt they were desperately underfunded and comparing them against all, all the other APA uh, uh, participants or against their other Carnegie classification of research very high, uh, of $7, nearly $7 and a half, one would appear that yes, they are very underfunded. Using generation one analysis, we, we certainly could understand that they are uh, in a world of hurt trying to maintain their, uh, their building space. Their facilities operating expense as a percent of the campus uh, replacement value known as CRV. This is a metric of uh, the amount of resources that the campus is spending against the value of the, their building, they were annualized expenses of only a third of 1%. Uh, the APA average tends to run about 1.6% that year, and the Carnegie classifications uh, of research very high, which institution one is, it's a public research institution, uh, was about 1.3%. Uh, again, this does not include capital uh, in this metric. It is only the annualized facilities operating expense, that AFOE that we described before. Looking at the next metric of the capital expenditures on existing space, this is the amount of uh, money being spent to recapitalize the campus, the amount of money being done, uh, spent to address deferred maintenance. They were again, barely a third of 1%. All APA was spending at a rate of about 2.7% and 2% plus for the research very high. Looking at these three metrics using generation one uh, analysis, we could say this institution is, is, uh, uh, is ex exceptionally underfunded is what it would appear. Moving to generation two and asking the question, are we getting full value for the money that we're spending for the resources? Starting to look at the utilities bill, the one thing that we, we noticed, their cost per gross square foot on utilities on, uh, in, in this metric number four, they're spending about $2.66 per gross square foot. Their research peers are spending slightly more. If we look at the fifth metric, we can understand why. This institution, institution one, is able to purchase a million BTUs, whether it's electric, gas, or other energy sources, for about $12.5 per million BTUs. Research institutions, the APA averages in research institutions are nearly 40% higher at $17.25. So this institution has an advantage in terms of, of, of uh, utility costs. But if we look at the last metric in terms of utilities and energy BTUs per gross square foot, that advantage is not being taken care of. The, the 
institution one is burning up about 15% more energy per gross square foot than their research peers. So it is difficult with cheaper energy sources to exercise a lot of utilities uh, conservation measures. They don't pay for themselves as quickly as when energy costs are higher, but they still do pay and they can still save resources. So using in, uh, uh, generation two uh, uh, evaluation, we might question whether they're getting really full value. A good energy conservation program at institution one probably is not going to completely close the gap on their, their, uh, their funding deficits in, in terms of uh, maintenance, but it sure could help and it would, it would start moving them in the right direction. In terms of a qualitative uh, 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 measure, APA measures service levels one through five, service levels of either custodial, maintenance, or ground. One is the best service level, the highest service level, five is the lowest. Higher education tends to try to live in the two to three range. This institution, institution one, is was because of their struggling with the uh, funding level, they were at a level four. So they're both in, in terms of quantitative and qualitative metrics, they are still, they are still struggling. And, <clears throat> and uh, if we go to the next slide, uh, which is more current data, this is a table of of again we've got institution one and we fast forwarded here here about six or seven years and it's again at information direct information out of the APA FPI uh, survey institution one here has improved their their uh, funding level their AFOE those annualized facilities operating expense along with the, the purchase utilities, they're now at $6.63 per gross square foot. Of that, about $1.16 is maintenance going into their buildings. They still feel like that they are underfunded. If you compare them to uh, a group of different uh, research institutions, A through F, which are all uh, public research institutions that they compare themselves to, they are still performing, they're still struggling in terms of their performance. They still feel like that they're very underfunded. Uh, <clears throat> they're the lowest cost per gross square foot in terms of spending, and they're also the lowest performance level of service. The difficulty that this institution faces is if we transfer that cost into a cost per student going to the next table, that we can see that they are the highest cost per student. Their AFOE cost on a per student basis is $1,673 per, per student. If we add in the utilities cost, it jumps another, almost another $1,000. They are the lowest cost in terms of cost per space, but they're the highest cost in terms of cost per student. I would submit that this is a very dangerous place to be. They, to solve this problem, they are going to need to either shed what appears to be excess space, or they're going to need to recruit more students to disperse that, uh, that space. They are at a competitive disadvantage in terms of a cost per student. These are difficult situations to, to solve. It's a lot easier to prevent this situation from happening than it is to solve it. We all know that once space is in existence, trying to repurpose it is more expense. Trying to shed it is difficult. It's often a sacred cow, as uh, Larry might have referred to. 
And one of the things that institutions have a lot of difficulty doing is letting go of, of space once they already have it, even though it is expensive. So trying to make sure that we do not uh, uh, get into this situation is a lot easier than trying to solve it after the fact. Trying to optimize their, their performance further is, is probably not going to solve the problem. Peter Drucker had a great quote when he said, there is nothing so useless in the world as trying to do efficiently what should not be done at all. Trying to take care of an extra 100,000 square feet or an extra million square feet of, of space with existing resources, space that may not be uh, generating an appropriate return, or space that may not be necessary to support the, the educational or research mission, is trying to do efficiently what may not need to be done at all. At that point, I'm going to turn this back to Lander, and we can uh, pick this up with any further questions in the Q&A. That's excellent. Uh, Dwayne, I really appreciated, um, and, and I do know these uh, stages of performance measurement evolution, and I have, you've given me um, gracious use of them with Nakubo. And you're right about the inclusivity of the third generation requiring the broad-based enterprise-wide conversation is so important and where we many times fall short. I like the way you linked all three of those to complete a story in that case study from the use of the FPI and then the alignment with those stages and ultimately with the institutional metrics and what then becomes even more obvious. If we can do prevent rather than um, have this happen, which many of our institutions are going to need to think about, um, it's going to be critical. And of course, Peter Drucker is right on, right? <laughs> His quote um, is uh, perfect. So let's now go to Howard uh, Tybell, President, Tybell Education Consulting. As founder and president of Tybell Education Consulting, Howard and his team partner with colleges and universities to transform how faculty, administration, and boards work together to accomplish their mission. Through team building retreats, strategic planning programs, and their online education leadership course, they can help you accelerate building a culture of shared commitments while ensuring all levels of the organization are rowing in the same direction. As a public speaker and writer for numerous education associations, Howard contributes to the national discourse on emerging trends facing education. His 10-year running podcast, Navigating Change, brings together thought leaders to explore innovations that transform how teams in education and business work together. His latest offering is a leadership course that begins this coming January for AVP and director level folks in higher education. Visit his website for details. Now, finally, Howard's recent academic contribution includes partnering with the president, uh, Don Burks of Plymouth State University on the book, Redesigning Higher Education systemic integration and cluster-based learning. He has numerous well-known institutional clients from both public and private colleges and universities. Howard will move now to the intangible nature of culture and collaboration to effectively navigate the use of tangible data and strategies and the discipline needed. He will explore the use of storytelling to demonstrate its effectiveness toward making a contribution in a relevant way to the conversation. He will discuss how to get people to work across boundaries. Howard. Thank you, Lander. So, uh, Lander, before you go, um, how much time would you like me to take? No, you're you're fine. You do what you were going to do. We're okay. All, we, all right. Very good. Yep. Excellent. Yep. A student this week in our leadership program spoke something that I think is so relevant for this conversation. Good sailors were never made on calm seas. I think this is the seeds of a certain wisdom of challenge cultivates resiliency. You know, there are really three things I want you to take away from this as you start to explore how you take away from Dwayne and Larry and myself some of the principles from today. One, that we need to start thinking about and mobilizing our teams beyond the daily crisis. 
Second, shifting from reacting to responding. And when I say responding, I mean declaring the future that involves a higher purpose and engaging our people. And the third thing is making tough, timely decisions, which I think we're gonna to continue to be in a position to do. Uh, I'm gonna talk about mood in a moment. And there's two kinds of moods to be in this conversation uh, with all this information being thrown at you. One is a mood of perplexity, which is, I don't quite know what to do with this, but I like it. And the other mood is confusion. I don't know what to do with this and I don't like it. So what I invite you to be in a mood of is a mood of perplexity. You know, in our leadership program, as Lander mentioned, we tell people, we're not playing tennis, we're swinging a racket. And when an athlete is preparing for a match or a race, you don't want them thinking about what to do. When you need to call for layoffs or furloughs, when you need to pitch an idea to your president or board, when you need to speak truth to power, you can't be thinking about it. You need to just do it. And culture change, I think we are discovering, is really about those skills that you and your roles uh, can cultivate to actually change the larger culture. And the good news is these skills can be learned. You know, I think that today more than ever, it is not an easy time to be a leader. At the same time, the key opportunity is to give confidence to your people that will get through this. Next slide. Since 2010, on the left here, we've been getting the very same word cloud back when we work with large groups. COVID hits in March and every single slide that comes up when people type into this word poll is looking like the one on the right. So we've gone from a mood of overwhelm, perpetual overwhelm, which is the precursor to burnout, to a mood of anxiety around uncertainty. And I think this is a significant shift we need to address because there's the stuff we need to get done and then there's how are people engaging in that. And the work I think we have as leaders is to start to help people deal with this uncertainty. You know, COVID has brought back this phrase called liminal space. It's that period in between, such as the summer between high school and college, ending a job before beginning the next one, uh, after a medical test and its diagnosis, after an election and the results. Theologian Richard Rohr defines liminal space as that experience when we go through a significant transition, and, and I love this quote from him, it is when you have left the tried and true, but have not yet been able to replace it with anything else. It is when you are between your old comfort zone and any possible new answer. If you are not trained in how to hold anxiety, how to live with ambiguity, how to entrust and wait, you will run anything to flee this terrible cloud of unknowing. And one way to address this that we have discovered really works is to help yourselves and help your teams name your moods. To be able to recognize a mood, to be able to call it out, and to not talk about it as good and bad, because moods are always in the background, but they are central to our capacity to get things done. When I'm in a mood of resignation, I show up very differently than I'm when I'm in a mood of ambition or a mood of, of uh, confidence. And this is the same for our teams. So one of the things I'll suggest to you, and you should be perplexed about, per per perplexed about this, is how do we raise allowing people to express themselves and see whether the mood that they find themselves in are productive or unproductive versus good or bad. And if you're a leader, manager, or just wanna generate the change that you're looking for, this is fundamental. Next slide. You see, the pandemic is not your problem. The pandemic is fundamentally a revealer and accelerant of the underlying dysfunction of our institutional structures. With many metrics we can point to, including 20 years of tuition outplacing inflation. And I'm not saying it's not a problem, but I'm saying as a leader, 
because it is a part, we can frame it as a problem, but I'm saying as a leader, we need to think about how to use what we're in the middle of as a way to mobilize our teams. So what do you do about this? I know many of you uh, who are in facilities roles, especially if you're in a senior facility role, have a conversation about having a seat at the table where strategy is being developed versus having the strategy being developed behind closed doors and handed to you to execute on. Having a seat at the table doesn't itself produce the results you want, right? We know lots of leaders or people in a position of authority that can't move things forward or don't move things forward. Fundamentally, leadership and the capacity to move things is about storytelling. And there are three elements to a story. What you wanna do, how you wanna do it, and why it's important. So I can tell you that nobody cares what you wanna do. What does not inspire? People care why you want to do it. This inspires. An anecdote, back in 1967, Pr Princeton was deeply engaged in the question of bringing women to Princeton, making it co-educational. And Yale found itself concerned that Harvard's proximity to Radcliffe could be a potential threat to their own uh, sort of continuation. So Yale president, King, or that they would go, for example, to Princeton and that they would not end up going to, uh, to Harvard. Yale Princeton at a gathering of alumni said, our concern is not so much what Yale can do for women, but what women can do for Yale. This inspires, right? If he had just said, we wanna bring women, yeah, that's what you wanna do. So this raises the why question. So how do you get to the why? If you're trying to motivate a team, step one is to have a key message. And think about what a key message is. It's that singular thing you want people to take away. If you were giving a pitch, if you were leading a presentation, if you were talking to your team, and from that, your key message has the things you wanna produce. Next slide. This is a tool that we use in our leadership program, also in our communication work is if you look at this visual here, the top here is the key message. From my key message, I have the things I wanna produce, the outcomes or the results, three, and three is the magic number because nobody can remember four things and there's always one more than one. And if you have two things, then people are always comparing which one's good or bad. But what comes out of your outcomes are your topics, the things you wanna talk about. So let's look at an example. If I was trying to, rec in, in, uh, next slide please. If I was trying to enroll people to work at my university, my key message that I want them to take away is why my university is great. And I might have three things I want them to walk away with from that key message. It's a great place to work, solid reputation, fantastic mission. From my outcome, I want you to tell me, it looks like a great place to work. There are three topics. It's a culture of transparency, great professional development opportunities, and beautiful campus. And same for the other two. I can tell you when people take the thing they want to present to somebody and you map it through this very simple tool, you begin to see what topics you think are important, but don't support your outcome. And the reason this is also important is very often we go into a pitch, we have the things we wanna talk about, we don't have a clear outcome and we don't have any clear key message. So what I'm suggesting to you is consider before the next time you present something, mapping it through that, just take out a landscape sheet of paper and say, what is my key message? And you should be perplexed by that because it's not obvious, right? It's in the background, but your key message is what inspires, not what you wanna do. If you look at this, the what's on the bottom, the topics, the how is the outcome, and the why is the key message. Another area that we work on heavily in our program is language. And we do this through some fundamental speech acts that we work with, uh, that can move things for others. And there are two fundamental speech acts we have at our disposal. There's others, but the two I'm gonna to speak to, next slide, are making requests 
and offers. You see, we all know what a request is. A request fundamentally, and this, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm summarizing something that we take a lot more time with, but I wanna give you uh, some key ideas behind this. A request is about what I want. An offer is about, about what you need. And if you begin to shift to making more offers, you will find that you will have the capacity to build trust on your teams. You see, most of your people that work for you or the people that report to you are waiting for fulfilling requests. What do you want me to do? And part of what we're helping teams learn is through an organization, we need to have more people making offers. And this is what we loosely call being proactive. You see, if you go to your faculty and you said, I need you to vacate this building because we're making some different decisions about this particular, um, the, the physical plant, they will potentially fight you with it, you know, if it's a request versus a demand. But a request is very different from going to your faculty and say, listen, I'd like to convene, I'd like to make an offer to you. I'd like to convene a group of faculty of your peers and understand what your concerns are about facility utilization. And let's start there. I can tell you, you start making more offers in your communities, you will find that you will have people being more open and trusting and you'll build engagement within your community. So this is a fundamental principle that I want you to take from today. And finally, at, and, and I think the, the thing I, I, I want to end with you all is that we are all always learning. How many of you have ever heard of the imposter syndrome? Raise your hand. I know I can't see you, but raise your hand anyway. Let's pretend like I can see you. The fear that someday someone will figure out that you don't belong in this role, that you're an imposter. And maybe it's time to embrace that we're all imposters. Now, I wouldn't truly suggest that you ever say that I'm an imposter, but I'm gonna use a different word, and that's being a beginner. Peter Denning, a colleague, professor at the Naval Post-War Academy in California, was instructing his graduate school students who are experts in operating systems, but they're not experts in operating systems, but they were experts in other domains. They took their first test and they all failed. And when he handed back their homework, you can imagine what their mood was. It was negative. Now, how do you know you're looking at a negative mood? Their heads were down. There was no eye contact. People weren't speaking. And he looked at the group and he said, I have a question. How many of you are an expert at something? And all 32 hands went up. And then he said, how many of you are a beginner at something? All 32 hands went up. He then asked, how many of you like being beginners? Two hands went up. And he said, that's what we have to work on. That night he went home and created what he ended up coining the beginner's creed. And I'm gonna read this to you now, and I'd invite you to put aside whatever else you might be focusing on and just listen to this almost like a mantra or a meditation. The Beginner's Creed. I am a beginner. I am entering a new game about which I know nothing. I do not yet know how to move in this game. I see many other people playing in this game now. This game has gone on for many years prior to my arrival. I'm a new recruit arriving here for the first time. I see value to me in learning to navigate in this domain. There is much for me to learn. The basic terminology, the basic rules, the basic moves of action, the basic strategies. While I am learning these things, I may feel various negative reactions, overwhelmed at how much there is to learn, insecure that I do not know what to do, inadequate that I lack the capacity to do this, frustrated and discouraged that my progress is so slow, angry that I've been given insufficient guidance, anxious that I will never perform up to expectations on which my career depends, 
But these moods are part of being a beginner. It does not serve my goal and ambition to dwell in them. Instead, if I make a mistake, I will ask what lesson does this teach? If I make a discovery, I will celebrate my aha moment. If I feel alone, I will remember that I have many friends and colleagues ready to help. If I am stuck, I will ask for help from my teachers. Over time, I will make fewer mistakes. I will gain confidence in my abilities. I will need less guidance from my teachers and friends. I will gain familiarity with the game. I'll be able to have intelligent conversations with others in this game. I will not cause breakdowns for promises that I lack the competency to keep. I have an ambition to become competent, perhaps even proficient or expert in this game. But for now, I am a beginner. Larry talked about, we have never been through this pandemic. We are all beginners in a pandemic. Our people are finding themselves even more distant from what it is that they're supposed to do. And the more we give ourselves permission and our people to have it be okay that they don't know, and to be beginners, the more people are going to engage and be willing to reveal when they're stuck, when they don't know how to do something. So I'd encourage you when you get this deck is take this back to your teams and read this out loud and talk about it. When we've done this in our programs, I can tell you it has touches people very personally and it opens up a certain kind of conversation that we often don't have. So that's where I'm going to leave it right now, Lander, and turn this back to you. Thank you so much, Howard. That was really wonderful. And you know, you've um, you've done something that when we talked about a panel, we talked about tangible to intangible. I think you've taken the seemingly intangible and made it tangible, which I know was a goal, um, a great way to reframe the conversation. And indeed, we are all uh, imposters for sure. Um, but I will definitely take this to the staff and to the board and read it out loud and use it as a way to open up a new and different conversation. Um, because I think it does give us power in terms of confidence that we all are, um, we're all ready to have a new conversation, right? That's that confidence. And the other thing I want to comment on, Howard, and then um, we'll ask some questions here is, some pretty simple tools to map it. I know in Simon Sinek's work, which I'm sure, Howard, you are very aware of, um, when you were talking about key message to outcomes to topics and the what, the how, and the why in reverse. Um, and it it isn't obvious because we don't, when Simon Sinek talks about the why, we don't really, we don't have as much language for that. It's hard for us because of where it sits in the brain, but it is emotional. And we can get there if we do the work, right? And Correct. I see that that's indeed what you're asking us to do, to actually write it down. There was a gentleman who said, writing crystallizes thought and thought precedes action. So this gives us a way to actually crystallize our thoughts and then use those to actually um, proceed with action. So very powerful for our, our folks. And so Howard, I'm gonna ask you, and then maybe our other team members can, our panel members can chime in, but you know, and there was a statement made, I was on your webinar um, last Friday and uh, we were talking about that we're in this together, we've been in it together with a common goal, one to beat COVID and to bring students and faculty back to campus, right? And then we, um, uh, the thing was, and it was really powerful, they said, can we sustain this type of collaboration post COVID? Can you speak to that um, as you did then maybe, and maybe, um, Larry, then Dwayne could talk, because I think this could give us a good launch point for the ways in which we might rethink and reimagine this new framework for higher ed um, and, and, and that building a sense of value. Howard, do you want to start that? Yeah, so let me just say something briefly. You know, this can we sustain? I think 
there's a certain level of tiredness and exhaustion. And, and part of this is, is we are finding ourselves uh, really focused on getting through what's right in front of us. I think the shift that needs to happen, and I think both uh, Larry and Dwayne touched on it in their own way, is we need to help people elevate to a different horizon. The horizon needs to be not even post COVID, but what does it look like, the kind of institutions that we want to find ourselves working in. This is the opportunity to have the conversation that is not about getting through what's right in front of us. And that requires the hard work of having leaders articulating a vision, then saying, I'm gonna engage my team and then that team is gonna engage the layer down and we're gonna be in a conversation that's an exploration conversation. It's not a problem solving conversation. It's exploring what the future, and then from that exploration comes the decisions we can make. We have to stop focusing on everything as a decision or something that needs to be solved, but it's a different kind of conversations. Last thing I'll say is the difference between having a conversation for action and a conversation for possibilities. And what you wanna frame for your teams is a conversation for possibilities. That's great. I really appreciate it. Uh, Larry, would you like to chime in on this one? Yeah, yeah, and I actually want to pick up right where Howard left off because I think that's so critical. This idea of thinking about possibilities. So often we plan as if the decisions are already made. And that's why we end up with suboptimal results. Sometimes we don't shoot far enough. So in the current circumstance, if all we try to do is get back to where we were, think of the opportunities that will have been missed, right? So I alluded to this just briefly in my conversation about what could happen as a result of the shift to virtual learning, virtual instruction. Many individuals who wouldn't touch that with a 10-foot pole were forced to, and now they have become very skilled in a very short amount of time. And I have a, my, my son-in-law actually is an instructional designer and works with these folks, and he, he, he tells me all the time how he marvels at people who he couldn't get engaged, who are just doing incredible things now. And that's because just what you said, Howard, they embraced the possibility once they got over their anger that it was being thrust upon them. And so I, I, I really think that's an approach to planning that is underused, and that is to spend time thinking about the possibilities, to really figure out what would be better than what we had pre-pandemic, not just let's get back to where we were pre-pandemic. So I, I, I think that's just a very powerful concept, Howard. It is, and I would um, say, I track us back to Howard's initial comments and um, action around moods and naming them. Um, when you talked about your son-in-law and first recognizing the anger, that was the moods, uh, and that, that was where he went. And then he could embrace the potential of possibilities, right? So you did a really nice job, Larry, of connecting those dots to that as well. Dwayne, did you want to comment? Uh, it, sure. Oh, only uh, that I uh, like Howard's approach to storytelling. Uh, and when we use data and try to create information from the data, uh, if we understand the story that we're trying to tell, uh, and and that moves us uh, to the possibilities of the future, I think uh, that is a path that can be very productive to us. Uh, but it, it starts with reasonable data, uh, trying to make sure that we understand what it's saying to us, how it's speaking to us, and and then be able to communicate that to the possibilities of the future. That's good. Thank you, Dwayne. Um, and it really is powerful. And is I think all three of you have given us a way of really stepping back from it and putting language to it and thinking very differently about it. So on each campus, there are these different levels in the organization and there are different, you know, we have found that we have so much great collaboration now. I've been hearing that in town halls across the way and it has been very powerful. And so that collaboration, I'm hoping that we will invite everyone um, to the table, which I think the three of you are talking about. Um, now I have a, um, 
a question here that I want to grab because I don't want to miss this opportunity. Um, and, and while I'm uh, grabbing it, I want to make sure that you um, know all participants that this uh, entire um, slide deck will be made available and it's, it's all being recorded. So you will get that and you can um, listen to the whole thing. So a couple, few people were asking, oh my gosh, I was either late or I um, want to be able to hear this again because I do think that hearing things over and over again are really, really helpful. So um, one person said in the new reality that has been discussed today, in the rapid move to online instruction and learning, which may take hold better than in the last 20 years in the future, will we keep growing our universities or will some of us come to the realization we don't need more spaces to spend utilities or others' expenses on? So. Um, Dwayne, I'm going to ask you to chime on that one first, and then I'll go Larry and uh, possibly Howard, or I'll take you guys in another direction. Dwayne? Uh, sure. Uh, one of the things uh, I always, uh, as I travel around to different campuses, I, I hear the term campus growth. Uh, and I, I always cringe when I hear growth. Uh, I, I much prefer to hear the campus development or institutional development. Uh, just adding more space does not necessarily mean that we're getting better. Uh, and it, developing space, developing the activities within the space, figuring out how we can use space more efficiently, more effectively, uh, is often cheaper than trying to build new space. And um, Space is, space is expensive. It's expensive to build. And even though interest rates have been low uh, and capital has been available, uh, it's, the first cost is, is frequently uh, seems very palatable. But every square foot of space is uh, an, an ongoing expense. And uh, we also have to remember the most sustainable environmentally sustainable gross square foot we'll ever have is the one we never build. So if we can use our space more effectively, uh, whether it's with online technology or other methods of instruction and research uh, that are still being developed, still being created, still being thought about, uh, I think that will be uh, uh, very, very helpful for our institutions in the future. Terrific. It's a great um, way of thinking about it. And uh, we use that uh, illustration for sustainability, right? <laughs> so it's so important um, when we're talking about our own carbon footprint. Um, Larry, did you want to chime in there or uh, can I go to a, uh, adaptive versus technical solutions? Let me just make a brief comment, because I echo what Dwayne said. I, I think it was spot on. The one thing that I would add to that is this need to examine our space uh, before we start building space for all the reasons Dwayne said. But one of the things that I'm finding fascinating is hearing how campuses around the country are repurposing space to be able to conduct operations in a socially distant way that keeps people safe and using spaces that were not designed initially for that purpose. And so that type of creativity to look at a space and, and to use Howard's frame to say, well, what, what do I need to decide here? What's the possibility before you worry about that decision? So I, I, I think that's a really powerful concept of, of, you know, let's, yeah, money is cheap right now, uh, but that doesn't mean we should be adding space on campus. Um, we should be repurposing as much as possible and figuring out how to get more value from the investments we've already made. Good. And so I, I want to uh, go to Howard on this one, because as the two of you spoke about this, and Larry, you just talked about the repurposing of it as well. Howard, um, you've really helped us um, understand how we might change the messages. And um, could you chime in on this? Because I think it would be important to hear your perspective on the people, because you know these things exist. You've worked with way so many clients. Could you give us your thoughts on this from um, a different vantage point? Well, 
you know, um, when I when I listen to uh, the different conversations, I'm listening for what's behind mm. that's not being spoken. So, you know, this conversation, and I love how both Larry and Dwayne framed rethinking what growth is. And I think part of it is that we have this historical, cultural inertia of growth equals more. So some of this is a mindset shift, you know, and, and I think another aspect of this that I sp just spoke about recently is front and center is a crisis. I think we have, we have really learned what a crisis is. Prior to a pandemic in our lifetime, most of us have framed crisis in a way now that has, that has been shifted into a whole other, another, another dimension. And the crisis can be thought of many ways as a health crisis, right? And I think that's completely valid. And as leaders, we can talk about the health and safety of our students. But I think there's another way of looking at where we are right now, what's behind what's visible, is that what we have a, is that we have a crisis of trust and we have a crisis of confidence. And I'm looking to leaders to recognize where they can have influence in that conversation. The health crisis, the, the, the vaccine, all of those conversation is going to play out the way it plays out. And we have a role to play to keep our students and faculty and staff safe. But behind those actions that I have confidence schools are doing to the best of their ability, the thing that we need to really dig into is that there's a emerging or, or an historical crisis now of trust. Can we get through this? Do I trust my leaders that we're going to be able to move through this? And do I have confidence versus resignation that we can end up in a better place? And that starts with bringing people together and meeting them where they are. You start there, then you can build from that. That's fantastic. Now that really did uh, connect some dots. I will remind folks on one of the uh, town halls, we talked about um, really rethinking what growth is. And I'm gonna remind folks of that. And it is, was around, when you think of, I will just grow, I'll just get more students, I'll just grow myself out of this situation. There are implications and consequences, expenses, et cetera, that come with that decision. And we have a tendency to forget that and we don't think about it, we only think about that growth and those monies, those revenues that come from it. So it is a way of thinking differently about how we differentiate ourselves and for that um, overall competitive advantage. I think that makes a huge difference. What you three just talked about really gave us um, legs, I think, to, um, all that we have been struggling with, and you're indeed um, correct about a crisis of trust and confidence. I have a number of people who said, um, this was fantastic, I want to share with others at work. And frankly, that's what we want you to be able to do. And because we're at that time, um, I want to make sure that I honor um, folks uh, at close. So I will go to close at this point. I want to thank our panel Folks are gonna come back to this several times and they're gonna want it. By word of mouth, this is going to really explode. So all three of you, Larry, Dwayne, Howard, have done a fabulous job in this and given us so much meat on the bones with which to work. And we, we are poised, we have an opportunity, let's make it happen now. So remember uh, to register for the AFS, APAS Facilities Symposium. Uh, it is, uh, will be November 16 to 18, and registration is live, so make sure you continue your professional development. That's one of the three things research tells us that folks want, is they want flexibility, mobility, and professional development. Download the app called APA 365, try it out and stay connected 24-7. We have a standing call for images on COVID-19 engagement, and actually here's a slide uh, showing other available resources. Um, please save the date for our next town hall one month from now because of the AFS, we're doing that uh, three-day delivery on Friday, December 4th, as we will address experience exchange around your remaining challenges and we will move into the work, that body of work that we just heard today. So my final comments to you are, if you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go with others. That quote from an African proverb 
has reigned true in every aspect of humanity's accomplishments. Today, with so many global disruptions and changes, it's critical to have the most effective collaborative tools on deck and ready to deploy. So as you consider all that you face, consider this statement from Henry Ford. Coming together is a beginning. Staying together is progress. Working together is success. Thank you for the opportunity to serve you. you hope, we hope you'll join us on the 16th to the 18th and December 4th for our town hall. Have a good day and a great weekend.